We're here in Bristol next to the world's first great ocean liner designed by the genius engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And today we're going to be experiencing what it might have been like to work aboard SS Great Britain in the 19th century. In this video, we're going to immerse ourselves in the daily lives of those who served aboard this magnificent ship. From the very top of the chain of command. So this is the captain's cabin. This is probably where I would have been spending most of my time, right? To the very bottom. And if this ship is passing the equator, which it obviously does, and it travels down to Australia, you're just going to be hot all the time, aren't you? Exploring how the first ocean liner of its kind actually worked and what life was really like for the crew. Officially launched by Prince Albert in 1843, the SS Great Britain was the product of one of the most impressive feats of civil engineering in the 19th century. As the biggest iron screw steamer of her kind, the first across the Atlantic and one of the fastest to travel to Australia, the SS Great Britain required a crew of 130 officers, engineers and sailors for her operation and maintenance. To learn a little bit more about those who served aboard, I met up with Joanna Mathers, in charge of collections at the Brunel Institute in Bristol. So here we actually have a copy of a logbook for the maiden voyage of the ship to New York. To so New this York, is yeah. 1845, the ship leaves Liverpool to go to New York. And um, it's the very first page of the log, but there's so much detail in here. Yeah. I mean, just look on, on here. This is before the ship even leaves. He records two able seamen and a coal trimmer absent, so they didn't report for duty. They didn't report for duty, <laughs> okay, so do? already a panic before <laughs> yes. it even leaves. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. so they're already in trouble. And it's very regimented, they have to record yes. everything, don't they? Everything. So they're very hot on that. Yes, yeah. So there are several logbooks kept on any voyage. The captain has his personal one, but you have the official log which gets submitted to the, the, the owners at yep. the end of each voyage. And then, you know, a, a, a kind of a first mate or second mate, the officers, they might keep their own personal records. Okay. So, but if you look through kind of through the voyages I mean literally every hour so this is at one o'clock in the morning through to lunchtime 12 wow. noon and then it goes down to midnight every hour they have to record, record yeah. the weather kind of what condition it is how many uh, knots of wind kind of how many knots they're traveling at what the it's rate incredible. of wind is yeah and what do we have over here so these are then things these relate to the australia voyage of, of the ship so later okay, so a on bit later on yes, yes 1850s onwards 1850s, and yeah. this one here is actually uh, a cargo bill from 1860 Right. So even though the ship carried passengers, a captain and his officers very much still had to deal with cargo. With cargo as well, yes. Because you want to maximise your income on Absolutely. any given voyage, so you have to deal, kind of, whenever the cabins are full with passengers, you stuff every nook and cranny with yeah. a bit of cargo. And you have a photo here yes, as well. Yes, yeah. so this is a little um, carte de visite or, or like a little, almost like a, what we would now call a business card, if yeah. you would like. A so this has, card, yeah. um, has a ship, has a portrait of the ship at the bottom. So that's how the ship looked on the Australia run. And this is Captain Grey. Oh, there he is. Yes, There's there the captain. He is. Yes. Very loved captain. He was what, captain for uh, almost 20 years? Yes, yes, he was in charge for 18 years. Wow, and he was incredible. very well respected Shetland Islander. Yep. Um, he's described as a bit of a stout barrel of a man <laughs> with a deep booming voice. But I mean, you know, very commanding um, character. Yes, yeah. But to be in charge of, you know, one of the most prominent ships at the time yeah. um, for 18 years is a huge privilege and he huge clearly honor. was the man to do it. Evidently a good person to have in charge, but I was more interested in the lives of ordinary workers and sailors aboard SS Great Britain, some of whom left physical traces of their voyages behind. So Victoria, we've just been in the Brunel Institute, we're in the mm -hmm. Dockyard Museum now. One of the things that was pretty obvious over there is that the kind of ordinary seamen, the sailors, didn't leave that many written records, but there are a few clues as to who they were and what they were doing. Yes, and one of them here is a wooden plank that actually came from the forecastle in the ship. Wow, So that okay. was the crew quarters. And in 1867, Felix Grenier, who signed there, was an able seaman on the ship. Um, and so some, somewhere along the line during his rest time, 
he's decided to carve his name into this plank along with a lot of other members of the crew over the years. Right, yeah, you can see it very clearly up there, can't you? Yes. Along with lots of other graffiti. They were clearly spent, <laughs> spent a lot of considerable <laughs> amount of time doing this. Um, do we know anything else about Felix Grenier? So we do actually. So Felix um, ran away to sea at around 13. He was born in Shoreham in Kent. Um, so he spent his life working um, either in the Merchant Navy and on cargo ships. And in 1867, he actually signed on to the SS Great Britain as a naval seaman, so working under Captain Grey. Ah, Captain um, Grey, who we know of, yeah. Yes, um, so he only worked one voyage on the ship, but he sort of left his legacy here forever, really. And that's a little bit unusual, isn't it? I mean, how do we know all that information about a, a sailor? They don't normally leave these records, mm, do they? They don't. We're very lucky that Felix actually self-published his own memoirs. Um, so he spent the last years of his life in India, and it was there that he wrote this, this sort of book almost for his family to sort of tell them all about his adventures and what he got up to during his life. And what the ordinary crew got up to was exactly what I wanted to find out. Time to step into the shoes, quite literally, of a new hire. Hello, Natalie. Hi, Louis. Thank you for you. having me aboard. Uh, not a problem, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the SS Great Britain. Yeah, fantastic ship. Um, so I'm, I've just arrived aboard ship yeah. wearing this gear. I'm not sure exactly what job I'm going to be doing in it. Can you explain a little bit about what this is and, and who I'm going to be? Absolutely. So um, the outfit we've got you in at the moment um, would be worn by what is called a fireman. Okay. Um, so he was a member of the engine crew. Um, and it would be his job to keep the fires burning in the furnaces and the boilers of the ship to keep her massive steam engine going throughout the, well, it's travelling on the ocean. Right, OK. And I guess it kind of a unique thing about this ship is you've got the guys powering the, the coal-fired engine and sailors operating the sails, kind of harking back to an earlier era. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, there was actually three kind of main uh, groups of crew. Uh, so you had the deck crew, you had the engine crew, and then you had what was called the idlers or kind of like the steward crew uh, that would basically take care of the passengers during meal times. Um, so yeah, so um, when the ship went to Australia, she was both sail powered and steam powered just to enable that kind of long distance journey uh, to happen and, and keep to a rough time schedule. Got it. Right. I'm ready to see where I'm going to be staying for the duration of my three month journey. Uh, I okay. believe it's down here. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So uh, the crew would have stayed um, at the very front of the ship um, in different levels. So every each level would be a, a different crew group um, and they would have their own quarters um, just to prepare you. It's not the best space. And no, I don't get luxury aboard. Very, no, unfortunately not. It's very cramped, very dark, um, as you will see for yourself. Disappointing, but go on, <laughs> after you. Okay. Watch your step coming down. Yeah, I guess down. you have to watch your head coming yeah, down yeah. here. Wow, it's cramped already. Yeah, I'm guessing this is where the, the, the seamen would have stayed, right? And the, and the people yeah, working so, aboard. Yeah, um, so you kind of obviously, uh, it, it would really go by rank. So the, the higher deck would be um, some of the lower officers. Um, then you would probably have uh, the engineers and then you would have the able seamen. You know, um, there would be hammocks um, strung all throughout these um, areas of the ship. So you couldn't really swing the proverbial cat, to be fair. Right. They would be packed in. And then there would be an area right, right at the very front under the bowsprit, there would be an area for toilet needs. Okay. Um, the heads. The heads, course. exactly, yeah. yes, the heads. Um, but unfortunately, it, uh, these areas couldn't really be used in really rough weather because they would flood. Um, so yeah, so it was very cramped and a, a very nasty place uh, to have to do your business. Okay, right, so we're another deck lower down. First yeah. thing you notice <laughs> is that this is even more cramped. Absolutely, people yeah. People would have been living down here. Yep, yeah, so this is where primarily there would have been hammocks uh, for members of the crew to sleep in when they weren't on one of their watches uh, so they worked four hours on four hours off so when they were on that four hours off this is where they would come to rest to eat um, to just kind of wind down before being called back to the next four hour watch it was time i'd say to leave the cramped crew accommodation in the ship's bow and head up to the spacious promenade deck where i was reporting for duty as an ocean line officer 
Simon. How am I looking? You are looking the business. Ship shape and Bristol fashion, as we might say. Yes, I feel very pristine. I feel ready to command a ship like, like John Gray. This is it. <laughs> Clothes maketh the man. So yes. what we've got you in today, Luke, is clothing reminiscent of the really smart wear that the officers might wear for a special or formal occasion. Okay. Now, to our knowledge, there wasn't an official uniform for officers on the SS Great Britain, but many of them were Royal Navy men, they were Royal Navy reservists, mm -hmm. and they would have had a smart outfit like this, which is very reminiscent of the Royal Navy uniform. Got and in it. fact, some of them may have worn their uniforms on very formal, special occasions. So, I hate to break it to you, this is not necessarily your day-to-day -day wear, when you're commanding the men of the watch and you're overseeing the safe running of the ship. But this is what you're going to wear if you are on shore mm -hmm. and you, you know, you want to show off, you want to look your Present best. Present yourself, yeah. Absolutely. To dinners, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's say if you're a senior officer, you might be dining sometimes with the first class passengers. You know, you're representing the company as well as the crew. Yeah. And this is where you're going to put on this smart uniform that's, uh, that's very reminiscent of what you would wear as a Royal Navy officer. Mm -hmm. Captain in particular, he could be a really, really great representative for the company. You look at someone like Captain Grey, who had a fantastic reputation for being really gregarious, really warm with the passengers, very yeah. friendly, um, and loads of people talk about him being a huge character in their diaries. Not only are you, as a senior officer, responsible for the safety of the ship and the management of the crew, you're also sort of overseeing the social life on board as well. Quite a few responsibilities and am I correct in saying you're going to show me some of those in a bit? Yeah absolutely so we'll, we'll have a look around different areas of the ship where you might have spent your time and we'll look at some of the duties that that you would have been carrying out as a senior officer. Well I look forward to it. Before Luke settled into his easy life of smart uniforms and socialising I headed down into the belly of the ship. This was the blisteringly hot engine room where the real work happened. Hi Natalie, this, Hi. this has the look of a working area to it, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, it does. So uh, we are actually uh, right at the bottom of uh, the V-shaped engine, the massive 340-ton engine yeah, that operates the SS there. Great Britain. Um, and this is essentially the business end. So this is where you would be with your fellow colleagues um, and it would be your job, uh, job to um, stoke the furnaces uh, create that steam that's going to power the engine. So whilst you're down here, you are operating in temperatures between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees Celsius, and you work constantly for those four hours. Right, okay. Uh, so it is thirsty work. I mean, if this ship is passing the equator, which it obviously does, and absolutely. it travels down to Australia, you're just going to be hot all the time, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we have passenger diaries where even they're uncomfortable when the ship's going across the equator. So you can imagine these guys down here, uh, it just gets worse. So these uh, these power, uh, basically steam rises and that powers the engine which is just behind yeah, us. Yeah, so uh, the whole idea is to create the steam that will power the pistons. Uh, so this is an inverted V-shaped engine that was patented by uh, Isambard Brunel's father, Mark. Um, and essentially it would, um, the steam would push up um, into the area where the pistons were held and they'd also push steam down. So you'd get the push pour and it would create a vacuum which would cr uh, make basically uh, create the movement of the pistons going up and down and that's what will power the engine. And Natalie, if, if you had to choose between being one of the guys working down here or a sailor up on deck, which would you choose? I'd definitely be taking my chances on the deck. Right, I'd okay. definitely be an able seaman. You'd uh, risk going out onto the yard arm, all of that kind of stuff I rather would, than working down I here. would a hundred times go out on the yard arm rather than down here in this heat. I, I don't think I'd, I'd last. Right, okay. <laughs> An unappealing occupation to say the least, but an absolutely vital role aboard SS Great Britain, as I was soon to find out. Okay, Simon, so uh, whilst Louis is in the hot and stifling engine room down there with all the coal, I've been given the relatively easy task, I'd say relatively easy task, of turning on this engine. Go on then. So I just pull it back, push it forward, and there you go. There it is. And that's it, you know, the ship's heart is now beating. It's beating, yes. And would this be the lowest 
an officer like myself would ever go? Would I ever venture down to the so depths of the coal room? So it depends on the type of officer you are. If you're a deck officer, then the engine room isn't really your domain. You might come in here and check in with the senior officers as part of your sort of tour of the ship, making sure everything is going as it should. Or you might come down here to have a conversation with the uh, senior engineers if there was a problem, if we weren't making uh, the right speed, if we weren't sort of where we expected to be okay. on the journey. But no, this isn't really your domain. However, some of the officers were in fact the engineers. So the chief engineer and his second were officers, and this was absolutely their sort of part of the ship where they were in charge. Um, up on this upper level, this is where you'd be doing a lot of the maintenance, checking the valves for the steam pressure. Okay. The real hard graft is down below where Louis mm -hmm. is toiling away. Yeah. But even uh, as, a, as an engineering officer, you've got to get down there as well because you've got to be keeping an eye on the fires. You've got to be making sure there's a, a steady supply of coal. And some of the really important instruments connected with the boiler are down there as well. And it's quite a specialist uh, Absolutely. Sort of occupation, isn't it, a chief engineer? And it's, yeah. am I correct in saying they're actually paid not far off what, what I would be paid as a captain, right? Yeah, so actually, um, particularly when SS Great Britain first goes to sea in the 1840s, sort of large steam engines like this are really cutting edge technology. Yeah. So there's not a pool of experienced marine engineers to draw from. And so ship owners like the Gibbs Bright Company or the Great Western Steamship Company, they've got to recruit engineers from land, from early railways, mm -hmm. from mills and factories. And so to get them, to tempt them to see, you're paying a premium. Yeah, so this means the chief engineer is paid second only to the captain. You know, a chief wow. engineer might be earning as much as 25 pounds a month. You know, which is good pay, right? Which That's is good very pay. good pay. Yeah. If you look at the, the, the first officer, the yeah. mate, He's possibly only earning 16 pounds or 18 pounds. So the chief engineer really is second only to the captain. And of course, you mentioned earlier the importance of being on time, scheduling. Yes, that's absolutely. why this, this system is so important that we're supposed to be making speeds and people like myself, the officers, they're under pressure, aren't they? To get to these destinations absolutely. within a certain time limit. Time is money, yeah. know, just as it is today. Uh, no one likes to be delayed on their journey today. No, and it was exactly the same in the 19th century. So as the captain, you know, you're the ultimate authority yeah. and the buck rests with you at the end of the day. Yeah. But a good captain will listen to his officers. He will draw upon their expertise, take their advice, under under uh, his wing. So you're going to be listening to your chief engineers about the yeah. performance of the engine and you're going to be listening to your senior officers as well. Absolutely. And speaking of communication, yes. you can't help but notice this thing. Tell me what this is. Yeah. So these are our speaking tubes. Now, we're okay. very lucky in that the engine that we've got today isn't making a tremendous amount of noise. No, luckily. But if you imagine, <laughs> if this is actually being powered under steam, you've also got half a dozen men stoking the engines. You've got sort of banging going on as people are fixing things. It's incredibly noisy in here. Imagine. So there's no way we'd be able to have a conversation across the engine room. Right. And communication okay. can be really key. I mean, a lot of dangerous moving machinery in here. You need to be able to communicate with each other. And that's what the speaking tubes are here for. Really simple technology. You know, you speak into one end, the sound is carried along the tubes to the other. And this is a way for engine room crew to be able to communicate across what would have been a really chaotic space. I mean, should we give them a try? Yeah, let's do it. Shall I go Brilliant. around the other end? Sounds like a plan. Let's see if it works. Okay, Simon, Simon, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We are receiving you loud and clear over here, Luke. Is everything ship shape on, uh, on the port side? Everything's absolutely great. This is incredible. I can hear you perfectly. The quality, it's better than my phone. Leaving Luke barking out orders down the tube, I was relieved to be out of the furnace and heading back up to the weather deck, where Natalie was going to examine my skills as an able seaman. So Natalie, yeah. uh, what's our first task? What's my, my first kind of job as a sailor up on deck? So one of the things you'd have to do is obviously maintain the weather deck up here. Um, so you'll see there's lots of rigging, there's lots of flags, um, but also there's also the lifeboat davits as well. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the crew needed to know how to operate these in case of emergencies, um, and that's kind of lifting and lowering them as well. So we're going to take a trip over to the capstan okay. um, and see if we can test our muscle at raising and lowering Brilliant. the lifeboat davits. Some hard labour, exactly. good to start with, good to, to warm up. 
Um, so this is, is essentially a two-man job. Okay. Uh, you're not going to be able to do it on your own, so I'll, I'll assist you for this one. Oh, fantastic. Um, and we need to push it counterclockwise. Okay, so it's oh, an emergency. Right. We're about, we need to lower the lifeboats. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've been called into action. Exactly. Okay, so serious job. Three, two, one, go. Okay, let's go. You can see Ooh, it really it's, it. it's a tough job. Yeah. Ah. So you can understand why there would be two people needed for this one. At least two people? Yeah. Were there any instances actually where, where lifeboats were lowered? Any emergencies uh, during the SS Great Britain's voyages? Um, I think the only emergency situation uh, was in uh, kind of the SS Great Britain's early life um, in 1846. Um, unfortunately, Captain Hoskin, the captain of the ship at the time, um, had misread his maps um, and uh, made a mistake around the Isle of Man and ended up running aground in Dundrum Bay in wow. Ireland. Um, so, yeah, so that they needed to kind of get all of the passengers off as quickly and as safely as possible. So potentially the boats would have been used then just to get them off the ship itself and uh, safely ashore. Right, OK, so heading over to the port side. For our next task. Starboard side. Starboard side. Yes. Sorry, this is the back of the ship. Yes. Right. So I failed my seaman's exam already. It's all right, plenty of time, plenty of time to Okay, uh, what are we those. doing here? So, um, thought you'd, I'd bring you over here so you could uh, look at lowering and raising uh, the wonderful flags of the SS Great Britain. Yeah. Um, so part of your duties as deck crew uh, would be maintaining the ropes and the rigging of the ship. Um, and as you can see, uh, the SS Great Britain is displaying a, a range of multicoloured flags today. A lot um, of them, yeah. Yeah, so this is actually her launch configuration. So this is what she looked like on the 19th of July, 1843, when Prince Albert launched her from this very dry dock. Great. Excellent. Flying proudly at the top there. And then if I can remember how to attach this, I think yeah. that we go under and then over this way in a figure of eight. Very good. Tie this off. Very good belaying skills. Thank there. you very much. Whilst Louis reveled in rope work compliments, I needed to lie down and relax after a long morning of social interaction. Not sure how much relaxation you're gonna get, Luke, I'm oh afraid. Gosh. Because your cabin is here and it is not big. Wow. This is... Come on in. Tiny. It is rather petite. Now, what you have to remember is SS Great Britain is a commercial vessel. Yeah. And so the space on board has to be working, has to be making money. We want to give that space over to passenger accommodation or to cargo. So the captain is not going to get loads and loads of space. You do Evidently. get perhaps one of the most beautifully turned out cabins on yes. board, but it is rather on the cramped side. And this must be, what, less than three, three metres, three or four Yeah, meters? it's not big at all. Um, although, you know, at today's prices, you'd probably pay through <laughs> the nose in London for a flat this big, just, you know. Yeah. Um, this but would be deemed as spacious. It just seems incredibly cramped for arguably the most important person on the ship. One of the things you have to remember is you'd have been sleeping in here and that's about it. That's it. Yeah. You would have the stateroom where you're carrying out your administrative duties, meeting your other officers. Otherwise, you'd have been around and about on the ship. You know, a captain uh, has a really important visible presence yeah. uh, on board ship. You know, you're there, the crew want to see you, you want to be keeping a close eye on them. Um, the passengers are very interested in, yeah. in engaging with the captain. So a lot of the time you'd have been out and about being the sort of public face of, of SS Great Britain. You're not, yeah, you're not going to be an introvert staying in, inside your bedroom. No, day. absolutely Especially not. not. Well, but I tell you what, why don't you give yeah, the bed a try? Let's give this a go. Seeing as this see. is where you'd be sleeping. Let's see how this compares to your average Premier Inn. Oh, gosh. Right, I have a feeling already. Yeah, it's very short, isn't it? So it we is. talk about Victorian gents being yes. slightly on the small side. So typically, uh, your average Victorian is about five inches shorter than the average person today. OK. Um, so that <laughs> might explain slightly why the bunks tend to be a little bit on the shorter side. And um, the reason it's so narrow is to keep you wedged in when the ship's rolling. Oh, you know, OK. Whereas the seaman might be in a hammock, something that's going to swing, 
you don't have that sort of well luxury really this is supposed to be smarter and fancier this and is a supposed step to be up luxury. <laughs> um yeah quite it's all relative yeah. um so the idea was a narrow bunk will keep you wedged in and you're not going to fall over now where i think is interesting is a captain like gray you know he was over six feet tall i've read accounts where he's, he weighs you know 17 stone you know he's a big barrel of a man wow and to picture him trying to sleep in a bed this size or in a cabin like this yeah I'm you not know. quite 17 stone and it already feels very cramped. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think, uh, yeah, you're not going to be entertaining in here, but then that's why you've got the stateroom just next door. Absolutely. Let's go to the stateroom. Absolutely. <laughs> go on then. After you, Captain. Not quite the luxury Luke was expecting, but back on deck I was about to be equally disappointed with one of my staple meals after a hard day's work. Right, what have we got? What's my so, dinner? So, um, this potentially could be your dinner. This as... looks disgusting. Yes, uh, so obviously as a crew member, uh, you wouldn't have uh, the bountiful array of food that first class passengers and potentially officers would have eaten whilst on board the ship. This lovely looking dish here is uh, called uh, dandy funk. Dandy funk. Amongst your... Uh... I mean, it feels like wet soggy stale bread basically yeah so the biscuit we have used actual ships biscuits to make this uh, the biscuits are two to three years old though these so, biscuits uh, are two to three these two these biscuits oh, are two to three years old it's absolutely grim yes I mean, it's so uh hence why i wouldn't advise soggy. you eat it if <laughs> but yeah so uh bon appetit thank you thank you nasty for serving this up yeah. tough luck louis at least an officer could rely upon a good hearty meal each day. Full on the best food and drink the Great Britain stewards could offer, I headed with Simon to arguably the most important room aboard the ship. Right this way. Let's go in. Right, okay, Simon. So this is probably where I would have been spending most of my time, right? Yes, so this is your stateroom. This is the nerve center of the ship. Yeah. Uh, and it's from here that you will be keeping an eye on the charts. Uh, you'll be reviewing the logs. You might be having conversations with your senior officers mm -hmm. about managing the crew. So you might be reviewing the ship's logs. Yeah. Um, you might be meeting with officers and making sure that um, supplies were, were, were fully stocked or, or where they were supposed to be. You know, chatting with the engineers about the performance of the engine and the consumption of coal, double checking the navigational measurements the officers have been taking so that you know the ship is where it's supposed to be and that the voyage is, is going according to plan. And uh, what do we have here? This looks like a, looks like a sextant. You're it's... very, very close. Okay. This is actually an octant, an octant which is okay. a slightly earlier and slightly more primitive uh, instrument than the sextant. This is, is used for measuring um, the angle between the horizon and celestial objects in the sky like the sun. Now, as I said, the octant is a slightly less accurate, slightly more primitive instrument. So this is something that's probably used by more junior officers. Um, they might not get their hands on the sextant, which was a really precise instrument and probably would have only been used by the captain or the first mate. And they'd have had their own instruments. As a more junior officer, you might have had one of these in your kit that you'd be learning. And this is a sort of workaday tool that's typically used to measure, as I say, the angle between the horizon and the sun in the sky. And that serves a couple of important functions but it's all about really working out your longitude and your latitude okay how often would you uh, track your location so you'd be you'd be taking measurements every single day okay. um, a big one as i say was noon because of where the position of the sun is that can tell you all sorts about your position on the earth but they might be taking measurements uh, at night time as well from other celestial bodies like the moon or the star and uh, on, on the way to Australia, what sort of uh, areas geographically would someone like myself have to p potentially worry about? Were there any parts of the world where there are particularly rough seas or...? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's the other Cape. It's uh, Cape Horn, which is, okay, is, is one of the yeah. most dangerous parts of the oceans anyway. That's as you're coming around the tip of South America yeah. and you're making your way back up through the Atlantic. And that's where Great Britain would come on her return journeys from Brilliant. Australia. Yes. On the way out, she's gonna go around the Cape of Good Hope and she's gonna head along uh, further east to Australia. On the way back, she's gonna come around Cape Horn. To the that's, Atlantic. Yeah. This is it. And that's where the weather can be really, really dangerous. Yeah. 
And as luck would have it, the weather turned a little blustery as I was about to take on Natalie's final seamanship challenge. So Natalie, we're up on deck and for our final challenge, you've brought me to the bottom of the rigging, which is worrying me a little bit. Why are we here? Well, um, as you are taking on the role of an able seaman, I feel it's only fitting that you actually carry out some of the more dangerous duties that an able seaman would be needed to fulfil. Right, okay, so that involves me, I imagine, going up there. Exactly, yes it okay. does. Um, so an able seaman um, is the highest rank of seaman on board um, and that means that they would be able to hand, reef and steer. So it means you can handle any of the ship's rigging, uh, you can reef a sail in all types of weather conditions and you can steer the ship uh, strong and true uh, through the ocean waves. Got it. So I don't have any of those skills, <laughs> yeah. but what am I going to be doing up there? I'm going to be climbing up the rigging and then stopping, right? Yes, essentially. So um, basically you're uh, taking the footsteps of uh, an able seaman here on the SS Great Britain. You will be climbing the rigging up the main mast to the D-shaped platform, and then you will be um, ascending out across the yard arm. Right, out across the yard arm as well. Okay. Yes. And presumably, this is one of the most dangerous jobs on ship, right? Are there examples Absolutely. of people who've had a bit of trouble up there? Yes, um, uh, particularly one instance we have recorded in the ship's log um, is in 1853. Um, and uh, John Gray, who would later become Captain John Gray of the SS Great Britain, uh, at this time first mate. Uh, his cousin Ramsey was busy working aloft one day uh, when unfortunately he fell from the yard into the ocean waves below. Um, John Gray, obviously being family, wanted to immediately cut a lifeboat free in order to go back and rescue him. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the captain at the time uh, assessed the wind conditions and how fast the, sh the ship was moving through the water and unfortunately had to dissuade him from going back to, for his cousin. Right. So unfortunately, he was lost at sea. Pretty brutal. Full of trepidation after that warning from history, at least I had the protection of some 21st century safety gear. So Natalie, you've got me on here. I can't quite believe you managed to, <laughs> to get me to do this for the final challenge. Any last words, any tips for climbing up this thing? Yeah, um, I would just say uh, enjoy yourself, enjoy the view, and Louis, remember to hold fast. Thank you. Is that, that's an original original word of warning, is it? Absolutely, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> see, see, you, see you in a moment. See you soon. No turning back now. Not only did I need to make the grade as a Victorian sailor, climbing the rigging of a tall ship was already a badge of honour for three members of the History Hit YouTube team. Worth remembering from up here that if you did manage to fall off, you could easily be left behind. The ship wasn't likely to turn around to get you. It's getting pretty high up here. But an able seaman or an ordinary seaman would have to do this all the time. Rigging's done. That wasn't that easy, still pretty high. But to be honest, I'm more nervous about going out on this thing. So here at the top of the rigging, we're about 25 metres from the weather deck down there. That's the deck that you'd spend most of your time on. But we're only about halfway to the top of the mast. And rigging, of course, would have gone all the way to the top. Sailors would be expected to go out on the yard arm even higher up. And these masts apparently were named after the days of the week. So you have Monday back there, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. It was now time for the most nerve-wracking part of the challenge, climbing out across the yard arm. All right, we're stepping off. Let's see what the tension's like on there. Too bad. Imagine the sailors doing this wouldn't have had the same level of help. It's times like this when you think, thank God for the invention of the steam engine so that people didn't have to come up here 
take on these risks anymore. I mean, I've got a harness on, I'm perfectly safe. But lots of people fell to their deaths. So SS Great Britain is resting in the dry dock where it was originally built. And from here, you can see many of Bristol's major sites. So there's Bristol City's stadium just over there. You've got Cabot Tower up on the hill here and the medieval cathedral of Bristol over there. And just in the distance, you can't see it, but another one of Isambard Kingdom Brunel's designs, the Clifton Suspension Bridge just over there in the distance. That's not something I'm going to be doing again in a hurry. Very good experience though. Please do come and do it if you get a chance. An incredible and eye-opening experience and certainly easier for me than it would have been for sailors in the 19th century. Many of whom would have plucked up the courage to go aloft with their generous rum ration. The sun now shining again, I was ready for a post-voyage debrief with Captain Tomes. Oh, Luke, I have to say, that's been a really long journey to Australia. It has. It do, has. do you think you're ready to captain SS Great Britain? Listen, call me John Gray, because I, <laughs> think, I think I've got it. I, th I think I could handle it. It just involved a lot of socialising with the passengers, which was very important, of course. Right. A lot of logistical duties, admin work. But honestly, my chief complaint was probably the size of my roommate. The was, size of your room? It was tiny, did I'm you see, telling you. Did you see the size of them? I didn't even have a room. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down to wherever your right, rooms okay. were. And not only did I not have a room, <laughs> I had to go out on the yard arm. You know, that was pretty dangerous. Stoking the fires in the engine room, you know, in incredibly hot and horrible work. And then at the end of the day, all I get is just some horrible dandy folk <laughs> to sustain me. I mean, I've, I'm full of admiration for people like Felix Grenier, the, yeah, the, the able do. seaman that we're aware of. Definitely. But uh, yeah, a combined effort and a long voyage. It's been a good day. We've made it. We've made it. We've made it. That's the most important thing. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt to try and bring history to life, uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers, guys. See you soon.